Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lee and I'm a professor of physics at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University. This public talk is part of an initiative at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The primary goal of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties be between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Mark Schnitzer entitled Optical Imaging of Neuronal Dynamics in Healthy and Diseased Brains. Professor Schnitzer is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a professor in Stanford University's Departments of Applied Physics and Biology. His work has focused on the innovation and use of optical imaging technologies for understanding how large ensembles of neurons control animal behavior. His lab has invented several technologies that are now commercially available, including tiny microscopes that are small enough to be mounted on the head of a freely behaving mouse and that are now used by more than 500 labs worldwide. This technology won the scientists top innovation of 2013 and the 2019 method of the year from Nature Methods. Professor Schnitzer is a scientific co-founder of two Silicon Valley startup companies that have commercialized optical innovations from his laboratory. He was a member of the National Institutes of Health Advisory Committee that wrote the Brain 2025 report, the blueprint for the NIH Brain Initiative, and of the National Academy of Sciences Committee that wrote the 2022 Decadal Survey of Biological Physics. His lab extensively uses its optical innovations to study the principles of neural circuit operation, underlying perception, memory and motor control, and how normal brain operation goes awry in states of brain disease. He has received multiple awards in recognition of and to support his research, and 20 of his lab trainees have gone on to run research groups of their own at prestigious universities and research institutes around the globe. If you have any clarifying questions during the talk, please type them into the chat or the question and answer dialog box. Now at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Schnitzer. Thank you so much, Dean, for the opportunity to be with you in the audience um, today and for that kind introduction. Um, as you said, I'm gonna uh, tell you about, you know, the work that's ongoing in the field and in my laboratory on the use and development of optical methods for visualizing a large scale neural dynamics um, in the brains of both uh, healthy and uh, animal disease models. Now to start off the talk and to provide some uh, basic motivation for the work, um, we have you know, several motivations for studies of this kind. And first of all, our interest in understanding um, the dynamics and function of the brain is the fact that um, the question of how the brain works is, is a profound scientific mystery uh, with many different dimensions. Uh, scientists are still seeking answers to how the brain you know, perceives the sensory world, um, performs uh, cognitive uh, functions, and controls motor actions. Moreover, brain function, of course, is vitally important to human health. And I think there is a, you know, scarcely a person around who has not either been impacted directly or does not know a family member or friend who, who suffers from either a psychiatric or a neurologic disease. And so gaining future in, uh, further insights into brain function is uh, a very important endeavor in medicine. Now, why uh, should we be interested in imaging the brain? Well, I think this quotation from you know, Marcel Proust uh, says it best in a certain way. We're gonna be looking today at structures in the brain that are familiar from one perspective, but by applying new imaging technologies, we'll be able to view these brain structures in new ways and discover new things. And so imaging is, a, 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 is an important component of the experimental methods and technologies that we bring to bear in, in brain science. Um, 
Now we, we have in the field multiple different ways of imaging brain activity, and these include mag magnetic resonance imaging, positron emission tomography, and also microscopy. And what distinguishes light microscopy is that although it is generally restricted in use to a laboratory animals, it nevertheless remains nearly the only brain imaging modality that is capable of the cellular resolution and resolving the activity patterns of individual neurons. And I'm giving you an example of this here. This is a movie showing you uh, the activity of neocortical neurons in an awake mouse imaged using a particular form of laser scanning optical microscopy. And you can see individual neurons and their activity patterns, these cells that um, appear momentarily more brightly, as well as the neuronal dendrites. So this gives you a little taste of what some of our optical data sets will look like. Okay, now here's an outline for the talk. So first, I'm going to introduce the audience to microscopy methods for imaging neural activity in the live brain, generally in laboratory animals, and I'll describe some of the challenges and recent advances in the field. And then the second part of the talk will focus on signatures of brain disease that have emerged through studies using light microscopy. And I'm going to describe to you two different types of disease signatures that characterize different conditions. So first, I'm going to give you some examples in which we found imbalances in activity. Um, and the two, the, the two diseases that I'm going to focus on mainly here are Parkinson's disease and dyskinesia. And next, I'm going to talk about signatures in uh, the brain in which neurons exhibit um, aberrant coding. So I'll talk about a model for post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as a model of chronic neuropathic uh, pain, both um, of high importance to, uh, to society. So let's start off talking about uh, the optical methods that we're gonna need to understand the rest of the talk. So much, but not all of optical imaging studies of neuronal activity in neuroscience are based on what it, or it's called optical calcium imaging. And this uh, typically uses nowadays um, the introduction of a genetically encoded fluorescent reporter of intracellular calcium ion levels. So uh, years ago, people used to use um, uh, synthetic small molecule fluorescent reporters of calcium, but nowadays the predominant way of doing calcium imaging studies is to use protein indicators that can be uh, introduced through, um, through gene transfer, either using transgenic methods, making a transgenic animal, or for example, viral vector methods that can introduce a new gene into the neurons of interest. And thus the cells that we wanna study can be induced to express a particular protein that will modify its fluorescent properties in response to varying levels of intracellular calcium ions. And so you might ask, well, why is this useful for looking at neuronal activity? Well. Nearly all neuron types have what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. And so when the neuron is electrically excited, there will be an influx of calcium ions from outside the neuron to the inside during uh, the voltage depolarization of the neuronal membrane. This increase in calcium ion concentrations inside the cell leads calcium ions to be bound to the fluorescent reporter and these reporters have been designed such that that binding event will alter their fluorescent properties, which we can detect with light microscopy techniques and in particular methods of fluorescence microscopy. So here's another example of a, a data set taken using fluorescence calcium imaging. This is again in the mouse neocortex. The panel on the right shows a magnified view of the box here on the left. We're looking at the surface of the cortex and you can see some of the blood vessel patterns and those spots of light, which momentarily activate our individual neuronal cell bodies. And what you're seeing are the, the change in fluorescence and in particular a rise in fluorescence intensity when those individual neurons activate. And of course, here in the magnified view, you can also see some patterns of blood flow in the background. So that's the basic technique that I'm gonna be using and describing through most of the talk. I'm also gonna to touch upon an, a different kind of indicator, a fluorescent voltage indicator, which gives us direct readouts of the membrane voltage. Okay, so what are the challenges that we try to address in the, uh, in the field of optical brain imaging? So there are several challenges that the field is working on. So first, we want to be able to develop uh, improved methods for imaging the dynamics of populations of neurons in awake behaving animals. So not just individual cells, we want to see how large cohorts of cells uh, 
uh, may change their activity patterns in the context of awake behaving animals. And it's important to have awake behaving animals because, for example, if you want to study the neuronal control of movement, you have to have an animal that is actually moving. Or if you want to study the neural basis for cognition, you have to have an animal that is actually uh, solving a cognitive task and so forth. So it's important to develop microscopy methods that are suitable for use in animals doing the behavior of interest. We also want to be able to image dynamics in multiple brain areas concurrently. So for example, in the motor system, there's a suite of connected but anatomically um, distinct and distant areas that we might want to monitor concurrently. Many brain areas um, are inaccessible to conventional light microscopy methods because they lie below the surface of the brain. And since the brain is optically opaque, we're not able to address them um, with con conventional microscope objective lenses. And I'll show you a method using microendoscopy in which we can now image cells uh, in deep lying brain areas. There's also the desire to track individual cells and their activity patterns over multiple days. This is useful, for example, for seeing how neurons might alter their dynamics over the course of learning or life progression or um, disease progression. And so uh, time-lapse imaging methods allow us to follow large sets of cells for periods of days, months, and sometimes even up to a year. And as I just mentioned, our recent studies have begun to take advantage of what is called optical voltage imaging using fluorescent reporters that allow us to track the membrane voltage directly and allow us to visualize individual spikes or action potentials, the fundamental currency of information transmission that neurons use. And this, these methods have also allowed us to see voltage oscillations or brain waves. Now I'm gonna tell you about some different kinds of microscopes that are best suited to addressing these, challenge, these challenges. So first I'll describe uh, large microscopes that have objective lenses permitting wide fields of view to monitor neural activity across a large portions of the mouse neocortex, a bit similar to what I've been showing you. Next, I'll discuss microendoscopy systems using microoptical probes that can be directly inserted into brain tissue so that we can image cells in deep lying areas. And third, I'll show you how using microoptics, we have developed miniature head mounted microscopes that might be two to three grams in mass that can be mounted directly on the head of, of an adult freely behaving mouse. The mouse wears the microscope like a little hat and it allows us to visualize neuronal activity as the animal behaves in a um, in very natural manner. So let's start off with the first kind of microscope, these large microscopes to monitor large scale cortical activity. So this slide shows you an example of such a microscope. This is a system that my lab built. It's a so-called two photon fluorescence microscope. And it, it has 16 laser beams that are swept in a raster scanning pattern across the brain tissue, a little bit similar to what you might see in an old style cathode ray uh, tube television. And each laser spot addresses an individual pixel in the image. And by scanning the laser spots quickly enough over the brain tissue, we can address uh, all the pixels of a particular image. And so uh, this next slide, uh, uh, this one, oops. Uh, shows you what this looks like. So here um, you can see that the field of view of this microscope is large enough to encompass um, nearly an entire primary visual cortex in an awake mouse. Um, so this means that we get a, a essentially a full representation of the visual scene that the mouse is viewing, and we can track the activity patterns and see how those visual cortical neurons might represent uh, whatever the mouse is viewing. So I'm going to show you a couple different movies. Um, giving you a, a, a taste of the data from this 16 beam microscope. This is an awake mouse. These are indeed the visual cortical neurons. You can see them activating. And if you look carefully in this video, you can see some of the boundaries between the patches of the images that the 16 beams arranged in a four by four checkerboard pattern we're monitoring. Now, this, this is a later video from the same microscope. Here, the stitching between the patches is a bit more seamless. You may have trouble seeing the 16 different uh, uh, patches. And you can also see dendritic activity. So these are the processes that are emerging from the individual cell bodies, um, and those are sub those dendrites are subcompartments of the neurons that receive incoming signals. Now, if I were to ask you to look at this uh, movie of visual cortical activity and tell me what the mouse was actually viewing on the on the video monitor on which we were presenting visual scenes, I think you would be hard pressed to do so. There's not a uh, an easily um, discernible representation of the outside visual world due to the relative sparseness of activity in this area. However, here is a movie taken with the same microscope um, 
in the uh, in the superior colliculus. And actually, now you can get a sense that the mouse is is viewing uh, moving bars on the video monitor that we were showing it. And you can see, um, I'll play it again. You can see a representation of those moving bars sweeping back and forth across the neural tissue. And that is uh, an internal representation in the brain of a moving bar that is sweeping back and forth across the, the, video, the video monitor that the mouse is seeing. Now there's continued work in the field to further expand um, the field of view of these microscopes. Uh, this is a video taken of a, of a running mouse, a mouse that's running in place on a treadmill. And this is a large macroscope, a fluorescence macroscope, that is allowing us to see the activity patterns of a particular class of neurons, uh, layer two, three cortical pyramidal cells, as they're, as they're called. Um, and this microscope is not yet prospected. You can see that uh, we can see, we can visualize cells that are in focus here near the center, but near the edges of uh, the um, the curvature of the brain has made it difficult to keep all the cells in focus. So we are continuing to work on methods such as this and hope to be able to visualize cells across the entire curved cortical surface. So this gives you a sense of sort of what we can visualize today um, using these large mi microscopes um, for interrogating the cortical surface. Now, what about imaging neurons that may lie in deep brain areas? So this slide here shows you a sagittal profile of the rat brain and this orange band here that I've colored at the brain surface shows you the accessible tissue uh, if you were to use a confocal fluorescence microscope, a particular kind of laser scanning optical microscope based on visible illumination. And we can go about 50 to 100 microns deep into the cortex, this outer portion here of the brain, uh, leaving a, a vast terrain uh, uh, untouched, if you will. Now, another kind of laser scanning fluorescence microscope that uses infrared illumination can penetrate more deeply. This is the two photon microscope. It can go 500, maybe even 800 microns if everything has been optimized into brain tissue. But nonetheless, the, there's the question of how are we gonna image cells in deep lying areas such as the hippocampus, the striatum, and other interesting areas. So the solution that uh, my lab engineered a number of years ago, when I first started work at Bell Labs and before I had reached Stanford, was to develop optical microendoscopes that were small and thin enough that they could be directly inserted into uh, brain tissue. And these can be engineered in a variety of different um, diameters and with different optical properties. So here are two examples. Uh, in each case at the tip, you can see a tiny little micro optical objective lens whose main purpose is to give us the resolution we need to see individual cells, followed in each case by a longer but weaker relay lens whose main purpose is to give us the length we need to penetrate into uh, deep brain tissue. And here you can see um, that this 350 micron diameter microendoscope is about to penetrate into Abraham Lincoln's orbital frontal cortex. Now you might notice that these lenses are uh, cleaved to a flat face. They don't have the curved refractive surface that is typical of conventional lenses, such as my eyeglasses. And that is because these microendoscopes are compound elements composed of what we call gradient refractive index lenses. And here you can see some examples, doublet microendoscopes, triplet microendoscopes with either two or three lenses to put together. The objectives are all oriented to the left in these photos. And these use 1000 micron, 500 micron and 350 micron diameter uh, lenses. Now inside these Grin lenses as they're known is actually an internally varying refractive index uh, profile. So here is an, an example, a lens, and I've plotted the refractive index as a function of the radius from the longitudinal axis of the lens. And you can actually see that that refractive index is uh, lower at the periphery than it is on axis. And that allows us to guide light down the axis of these microendoscopes using a uh, total internal reflection. And by varying the strength of this gradient and this parabolic profile, we can tune the numerical aperture and other lens properties and by adjusting the length, we can adjust uh, the focal length. And so we have a great degree of flexibility uh, when we're doing the optical engineering. Now, initially we use these types of microendoscopes for different forms of microscopy using, uh, using them as an adjunct to um, conventional uplight, upright fluorescence microscopy. For example, once we've inserted probes like these into the brain, we can perform conventional epifluorescence imaging through these probes. This has the virtue of simplicity and allows us to acquire uh, images with a camera at fast uh, frame rates using full frame acquisition methods. 
we've also used these probes in conjunction with upright uh, microscopes using the laser scanning two photon fluorescence microscope that I mentioned earlier. And the virtues of this approach are that the infrared illumination and other advantages of the two photon microscope allow us to penetrate more deeply into the brain tissue. Uh, we can focally excite fluorescence uh, voxel by voxel or pixel by pixel. Um, and this makes this technique more robust to light scattering that may occur as fluorescence photons travel back from the laser focus to our detectors. And so this, act this technique actually provides optical sectioning, which means that we can look at individual slices of the tissue um, and assemble 3D tomographic issues. So both of these approaches have their own strengths and weaknesses. Now, one of the things we showed uh, about a decade ago was that using microendoscopes, we could perform time-lapse imaging studies in which we come back again and again to individual neurons over the, the life history of the animal. And to illustrate this, uh, you can see in this uh, array of images and also in this one, that over a period of two months, we've been able to come back through one of these microendoscopes and repeatedly image individual neurons and in fact, individual dendritic processes of cells in the hippocampus of an adult mouse that we've engineered to express a fluorescent protein. And you can see in fact, how stable the pattern looks over this, uh, this period of time. These dendritic processes are hardly changing at all. And that we find is characteristic of the adult brain and has also been verified by other researchers looking at other brain areas. However, when we look at an even finer uh, length scale at the level of individual synapses or dendritic spines, which are the postsynaptic morphological elements that accompany individual synapses in many of the um, excitatory connections that neurons uh, make, uh, we can see that even in the adult brain, these uh, synapses, which I've marked here with arrowheads, can actually change over time. So even in the adult brain, we've, we do find some uh, of these synapses that are persistent, but others disappear midway through a time-lapse imaging experiment. Some might arise and some might disappear and then arise. And so this shows you that even the adult brain is really quite dynamic with neural connections, neural synapses disappearing and new ones arising. And we can see that through our microendoscopes. Okay, now let's talk about the third optical challenge. How do we image neural activity in freely behaving animals? Well. A number of years ago, we realized that the, um, the CMOS uh, image sensor chips, the CMOS cameras that are commonly used in cell phones had gotten to the point where they were so good, we could now incorporate them into miniature microscopes and integrate all the optics and optoelectronic components that we would need to make a high performance microscope that the mouse could actually wear. And so this uh, slide shows you uh, an example of what one of these miniature microscopes look like. This one is two grams in mass and based on semiconductor optoelectronics, an LED light source, cell phone camera to uh, receive the images. And you can see blue illumination emerging from uh, the micro optical objective here. And I should say um, this system is now uh, commercial, has now been commercialized by one of the companies um, that licensed technology from my lab and Scopix Inc. And for disclosure, I have a, a financial interest in this company and continue to consult for them. Now this uh, slide here uh, shows you a little bit more about what's inside the, the miniature microscope. This was originally um, material from three different uh, PhD dissertations at Stanford. Kunal Ghost was an electrical engineering student who did the optoelectronics. Lori Burns, an applied physicist who designed the optics. And Eric Cocker uh, was a mechanical engineer who made the housing and this focusing screw cap mechanism. And this was a close collaboration with my colleague Abbas Al-Gamal in Stanford's electrical engineering department. And here you can see um, in more detail, the micro-optical objective peeking out, LED light source here on the side, the cell phone CMOS camera here on the top, and miniature uh, dichroican filter sets will reside here that will separate the illumination light from the fluorescent image that we get back. And this system can be combined with the microendoscopes that I showed you earlier to address deep areas if desired. Now, this uh, video here shows you what it looks like when a mouse is wearing the miniature microscope. Uh, the system is light enough that the animal can run at nearly full speeds, and these animals can do, do nearly any behavior that uh, neuroscientists might commonly use in the laboratory um, to test brain function. So here's another example. This mouse is freely behaving within a circular enclosure, and meanwhile, we are visualizing with a miniature microscope uh, the calcium dynamics of so-called hippocampal pyramidal neurons. Um, and so just as I explained before, when these neurons fluoresce more brightly, it indicates that the neurons are um, giving off spikes or action potentials. Now, because the system is so small, we can use it in the laboratory on multiple mice at once. 
And within the course of an afternoon, we can gather very large data sets. So here's an, a montage of images taken from a study uh, led by Jones Parker, Biafra Hananu, and Jesse Marshall. Uh, these miniature microscope movies are from the dorsal striatum. And I'll talk a little bit more about that study later when I discuss Parkinson's disease. Now you saw in the previous slide uh, activity in the hippocampus. It's been known in the field for, for a while that hippocampal neuron hippocampal neuronal activity encodes the mouse's position. And now we can visualize that optically. So here's a, a mouse that we've trained to run the world's smallest maze back and forth on this track. And I want you to, to note where the mouse is when this cell that's been circled uh, becomes active. And I've made it really easy for you. I've sort of marked this place on the track. And if you look carefully, you can see that that cell activates when the mouse is at that location. And moreover, it's gotta be going from top to bottom not bottom to top. So we, when that cell fires, we know both the location and the direction um, that the mouse is headed. Now we can assemble all the activity throughout the field of view in the hippocampus and actually uh, use the, the activity video to decode the mouse's position and trajectory. And so Lacey Kitch, an electrical engineering student, performed this analysis. The black traces here are the actual movement of the mouse back and forth in the track. And the red trace shows what you would expect based on statistical coders um, that we created using the video of activity. And you can see there's a very accurate record of the mouse's passage back and forth in the track in that part of the brain. So these are the kinds of things that we can actually discern and decode using our brain videos. Now, all the techniques that I've been talking about so far have been based on the calcium imaging method that I described at the outset. But what about trying to image optically the voltage dynamics of individual neurons directly. So the field has made quite a bit of progress on this. And in recent years, there has been the emergence of so-called genetically encoded protein voltage sensors whose fluorescence properties will vary with the neuronal membrane uh, voltage. And my lab and, and uh, Yi Yang Gong, who was a postdoc at that time, he now has his own lab uh, at Duke, developed a particular class of these protein fluorescent voltage indicators, which can be expressed in neurons of a desired type. And uh, these proteins will reside in the neuronal membrane and they alter their photophysical uh, properties depending on the neuronal voltage um, using an effect that is known as fluorescence resonance energy transfer. And so here you can see some example records of activity from an individual neuron that uh, we recorded electrically. The electrical trace is shown here at the bottom in black. You can see the individual action potentials, the spikes, and various features of the spike waveform. And here's what we recorded simultaneously using one of these fluorescent protein voltage indicators. And you can see how nicely the two records match up. So we've now been able to uh, use these kind of fluorescent voltage indicators in awake behaving animals. And here uh, is an example recording done by Simon Haziza in the lab using a new set of indicators um, engineered by our collaborators, uh, Madhu Kanan and Ganesh Vastan. In this case, we're using two different fluorescent colors worth of reporters, which have been targeted to different uh, neuron types in the visual cortex. And you can see in a running mouse, the patterns of, of neuronal activity in uh, these cells. Here's our records of activity from five indicators, uh, five cells that we, uh, uh, in which we expressed a green fluorescent voltage indicator and another five cells in which we expressed a red fluorescent one. And you can see the spikes as well as the subthreshold fluctuations in voltage in these neurons. The voltage indicators also give us the ability to track uh, neuronal oscillations or brain waves across populations of cells. So again, by targeting these voltage indicators to particular neuron types, we can see um, oscillations that have been documented before electrically, but had not been decomposed into constituent cell types. So here are examples using uh, optical methods to detect a relatively low frequency brain oscillation in the so-called delta band between 0.5 and 4 hertz. And this one up here is an example of a higher frequency oscillation in the 6 to 10 hertz range um, in particular neuron types. So to sum up the um, technology portion of my talk, uh, first of all, I've shown you some examples of large microscopes that allow us to image neural activity across the cortex. I showed you the development of microendoscopes that allow us to image cells, even some of the deepest, most ventral lying areas. I showed you the use of the miniature microscopes for watching activity in freely behaving mice, and the fact that with these microendoscopes and with the miniature microscope, we can track neural activity in individual cells and in large cohorts of cells over extended time periods.
New progress in the field has allowed us to uh, visualize individual spikes or action potentials in awake behaving mice using optical voltage indicators. And these same methods also give the ability to look at brain waves or, or voltage rhythms. And now in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna give you some examples of how light microscopy methods in the live brain have given us new insights into um, signatures of brain health and what may go wrong in the case of brain disease. And I'm gonna discuss uh, two different types of these uh, signatures of brain disease. The first category, as I said at the beginning, will be activity imbalances. And I'm gonna show you how uh, in two different diseases, Parkinson's disease and dyskinesia, which are typically characterized by opposite motor symptoms, there actually are opposite of imbalances of, of activity in the striatum, a portion of the basal ganglia. And I'll illustrate exactly what I mean by that in a little bit. And then secondly, I'll discuss cases in which neuronal coding becomes abnormal. And I'll illustrate that um, with studies in the amygdala, including of chronic neuropathic pain. So let's discuss first activity rate imbalances. And this was work that was spearheaded in my lab by Jones Parker, Jesse Marshall, and Biafra Hananu. Uh, Jones now has his own group um, at Northwestern University. Uh, Jesse is a postdoc uh, at Harvard and Biafra is a postdoc at UCSF in San Francisco. And this was a collaboration uh, with uh, Michael Ehlers, who uh, was at different institutions actually over the course of the study. So we were, in this study, we were very interested in uh, the basal ganglia and in disease conditions characterized by abnormalities of dopamine signaling. So I need to explain this, I need to give you a little bit of background on uh, the anatomy of the basal ganglia and dopaminergic uh, signaling. Now, one of the major uh, dopaminergic highways or projections, if you will, in the mammalian brain originates uh, with dopamine releasing cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, shown here in this sagittal view of the rodent brain. And receiving these, these dopamine uh, signals are two different classes of neurons in the striatum of the basal ganglia. And they, these two classes of neurons express different types of dopamine receptors that are called either the D1 or the D2 dopamine receptors. These neurons have different names. Sometimes they're called medium spiny neurons. And so these two classes of neurons are sometimes called D1 medium spiny neurons or D2 medium spiny neurons, MSNs for short. Uh, and sometimes they're called spiny projection neurons. Now, the, the basal ganglia has two different main pathways of neural signaling, known as the direct and indirect pathway. And it turns out that these D1 expressing neurons lie in the direct pathway, the D2 receptor expressing neurons lie in the indirect pathway, as they're called. And so sometimes you will see the abbreviations uh, DSPNs or ISPNs to denote the spiny projection neurons of the direct or indirect pathway. And this is the notation that I'll use for the rest of the talk. Now, the classical model or, or line of thinking on basal ganglia function proposed that the direct pathway spiny projection neurons uh, serve to activate movement. As, and that was their role in motor control of the body. Whereas the ISPNs, uh, which had a different projection pattern, different patterns of axonal output, were thought to suppress movement. And the model that tried to explain why the loss of dopamine neurons in Parkinson's disease might impair movement, uh, proposed that, that dopamine loss led to an imbalance of activity between these two classes of neurons. So I suspect that many people in the audience are familiar with the fact that Parkinson's disease uh, is caused by the death <clears throat> of dopamine neurons, um, such as these neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta. But it's not clear why dopamine loss would lead to um, the impediment of movement, the so-called bradykinesia, that is characteristic of Parkinson's disease. And so this model proposed that in a healthy brain, activity levels of the DSPNs and the ISPNs would be approximately balanced. Um, and then the downstream consequences of these balanced signaling would lead to normal activation of thalmocortical motor programs. Whereas in a brain typified with, by Parkinson's disease, this model proposed that the GO pathway would be underactive or hypoactive, whereas the ISPNs that serve to suppress movement would be overactive. And overall, this was thought to uh, perhaps lead to inhibition of motor activation, thus the impediment of movement. And prior to our work, there had been a number of electrophysiological studies, electrical recordings in downstream nuclei that lay downstream of the, of the striatum and the basal ganglia that were consistent with this, uh, this rate model. But, there had not been direct recordings 
of the DSPNs and the ISPNs in the striatum um, to test whether or not these two populations would have opposite of imbalances of activity because these two neurons have very similar properties in other regards and cannot be distinguished in electrophysiological recordings. So we reasoned that by targeting our calcium indicators to one or the other population, we could directly test this hypothesis that in, in Parkinson's disease, the DSPN should be underactive, whereas the ISPN should be overactive. And so we used calcium imaging to do cell type specific recordings in normal and Parkinsonian mice. And so this shows you a schematic of how we did this. We targeted one of these microendoscopes that I told you about earlier to the striatum. We targeted the fluorescent calcium indicator to one of the two neuron types. And midway through the experiment, we, um, we depleted or killed the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta to mimic a Parkinsonian state. Now, first I'm gonna show you here a movie of activity taken when a mouse is normal. So here we're looking at the DSPNs with calcium imaging using the miniature microscope that I just described earlier. You can see that these neurons activate when the mouse uh, activates its movement. And also you can see some clustered patterns of activation of the neurons. And we know that that um, is specific for particular types of movement, left turns, right turns, and, and so forth. So different clusters of cells will encode for different movements. So here's the timeline of this study. We first looked at normal animals. We then lesioned the dopamine cells. We then treated the animals with mainstay clinical treatments such as dopamine receptor agonists or L-DOPA, a precursor of dop dopamine synthesis. And these are mainstay treatments used in, in, uh, to treat Parkinson's disease patients. Now, at the end, at the end stage of Parkinson's disease treatment with L-DOPA, patients commonly develop what is uh, called dyskinesia, which is a hyperkinetic state <clears throat> in which uh, involuntary movements are exhibited um, and that these are uh, not under the control of the patient. So the, dyskine the dyskinesia and the Parkinson disease are characterized by opposite motor symptoms. In Parkinson disease, there's the impediment to movement. Dyskinesia, there is hyperkinesis or unwanted extra movement. Now, first let's look at the data from a healthy mice, normal mice. So here we found that activity rates rose with very similar um, dependencies on the mouse's uh, locomotor speed. And this is another analysis showing you that either at the onset of movement or the offset of locomotion, the two populations of cells, again, follow very similar dependencies. We then uh, rendered the animals Parkinsonian by a, a chemical lesion of the dopamine cells and looked again in the striatum. Now here we found some differences. So uh, one day after the lesion of dopamine cells, we found that indeed the DSPNs were underactive whereas the ISPNs were overactive. And we came back and looked at two weeks after the loss of the dopamine cells, and we found um, that the DSPN population was still underactive as a function of the mouse's locomotor speed. The ISPN population had normalized somewhat. You can see that this curve represents, is a little bit closer to the black curve that we, which we gathered before the dopamine lesion, uh, but there is still uh, abnormalities. For example, they appear to be overactive when the mouse is at rest. And moreover, we found that the ISPN activity seemed to be uncoupled from what the mouse was doing. So uh, despite the hypoactivity that we saw in the DSPNs, nevertheless, they continued to activate at motion onset and uh, decline in their activity at motion offset, whereas the ISPN population seems unresponsive or uncoupled to movement. And this was uh, very much the case at this two-week time point. We then treated the animals uh, with L-DOPA, and I'm going to skip over that data, but that uh, treatment was very successful in restoring um, more normal movement and also um, normal act activity patterns of the neurons. Then finally, in the end point of the study, we give a very high dose of L-DOPA to uh, induce what's called L-DOPA-induced uh, dyskinesia, similar to what the patients get in the late stages of Parkinson's disease treatment. Now, under this condition of um, high L-DOPA administration, 10 milligrams per kilogram of the mouse, the mice exhibited involuntary movements, hyperkinetic movements of the face, of the trunk, and of the limbs, similar to what is seen in Parkinson's disease patients. When we looked at the activity of the DSPNs and the ISPNs in this condition, we found the opposite imbalance. So the DSPN activity now was hyperactive, was overactive, whereas activity in the ISPN population was suppressed. So now it seems there's too much go signal, if you will, and not enough stop. And so this montage of videos uh, summarizes that state of affairs. So we have two different mice here. The top row is an animal in which we track the DSPNs. The bottom row is an animal in which we track the ISPNs. And you can see that in the normal state, the patterns of activity in these animals, even though they're different animals, are approximately matched. After dopamine depletion, you can see 
hypoactivity or loss of activity in the top row. This pattern now down here in the, in the middle column of the bottom row is overactive. And in the dyskinetic state, you can see loss of activity in the ISPNs and overactivity in the DSPNs. And so this is very satisfying in the sense that these two diseases have opposite motor symptoms, as I said, and they seem to be characterized by opposite imbalances of neural activity. And so we hypothesize that it is in fact these opposite imbalances of activity that are giving rise to the opposite motor symptoms. And so that um, this case study in which we were able to contrast the Parkinsonian state and the dyskinetic state very much exemplifies um, this uh, imbalanced uh, uh, neural activity rate, as I said, that can be one of the key signatures of brain disease. Now I'm gonna discuss the second category of uh, brain disease signature, and this is one of abnormal or altered uh, neural coding. And this work was initiated by uh, Benjamin Greva, who now has his own lab at the ETH in Zurich, and was a collaboration with Andreas Luthi's lab in Basel and, and Jan Grunemann, who was then a postdoc, but now has his own group at the University of Basel. And in this study, we were uh, initially looking at um, mice that had undergone Pavlovian uh, conditioning. We were looking in the amygdala and in particular a portion of the amygdala known as the basal and lateral amygdala. Here from a movie, uh, you can see uh, this part of the movie on the left shows that neural activity in the lateral amygdala. The right is from the cortex. We're gonna be analyzing activity from, uh, from the left. Now, in, in this particular study, we um, conditioned the animals to anticipate a light, foot, a light foot shock when we played a tone. And this is very much analogous to what Pavlov did when he trained his dogs to anticipate the delivery of food when ringing a bell. The animal after training will exhibit what's called the condition response to the tone uh, alone. And so in our case, uh, we used a six day behavioral pattern with this association being formed on day three. So initially we presented two different types of tones uh, and their assignments as the so-called condition stimulus plus or condition stimulus minus were randomized across the different animals. And one of these two tones was paired on day three with this light foot shock. And as you uh, might expect, the animals will, after training, exhibit a condition response to that. So unlike Pavlov dogs that salivated, the mice will freeze in response to the presentation of the tone. And that freezing response uh, is something that uh, an animal that is naturally a prey like the mouse will exhibit and as an, as a, as, as an exhi exhibition of the animal's fear. And so we can show that after training, the animals will, will freeze in response to the CS plus tone, but not so much to the CS minus. And you can see there's very little freezing in response to either tone before the training. And so this shows that the animal has formed a specific um, memory associating the CS plus tone with the, with the unconditioned stimulus, the light foot shock um, in comparison to the CS minus, which was never paired with the foot shock. So this uh, Pavlovian fear conditioning in the field has provided a lot of insights about um, structures and forms of activity that are germane to anxiety, an important uh, societal problem, as well as post-traumatic post stress disorder, another important uh, problem for many, uh, uh, in many contexts. Now I'm going to show you what uh, some of the data look like. So this is a mouse that has undergone the conditioning. We're about to play the tone. We're looking at activity in the amygdala, you'll see the mouse will freeze and we get a stereotyped pattern of neural activity here in the lateral amygdala that correlates with the freezing behavior. Now, when we analyzed this uh, neural activity, we found that the pairing between the CS plus tone and the unconditioned stimulus, the US, led to neuronal plasticity. Some cells heightened their responses um, to, the, to the tone and other cells that diminished their responses. And, so this top row shows a, an example trace of a cell that uh, potentiated its response to the tone over the course of training. This middle row shows one that underwent no significant change. And in this bottom row, you see a cell that declined in its responsivity to the CS plus tone. And this bottom set of data that I just showed you uh, summarizes responses of neurons before and after training, both for the, the CS minus tone and the CS plus. Now let's take a look for the CS uh, minus. Each row here represents an individual neuron and the color bar, the color scale indicates the level of the, of the cell's response. And you can see that across this population of cells, there's not a wholesale reorganization. The responses to the CS minus, which was never paired with the shock, uh, look largely unchanged. Whereas to the CS plus, we can see that after training, some cells have gained responses and other cells have 
diminished or lost the responses. So there's a whole reorganization of how this CS plus tone is represented in the amygdala after the conditioning. And what we found was the extent to which these uh, neurons changed their representation was highly predictive of the animal's response. And in fact, we found that the representation of the CS plus tone was becoming more similar to the representation of the light foot shock. And so each data point in these plots represents data from an individual mouse. And what you can see here through both a fear learning uh, stage of the experiment and through an extinction phase of the experiment in which we train the animals that the tone no longer is predictive of the shock, the extent to which the representation in the amygdala of the CS plus tone represent, or was similar to that of the US was directly predictive of how much the animal froze in response to that CS plus tone during both the fear learning phase and the extinction phase of the experiment. So you can see now that the, the representation of the tone is, is in a way sort of incorporating this aversive aspect of the US by mimicking the representation of the US. And so this is very interesting because it shows you that after training, the encoding in the brain of a neutral cue, a tone, has come to represent or to come to be similar to that of an aversive stimulus, even in the latter's absence. And so because the amygdala is also important in uh, processes underlying chronic pain, we wanted to know whether something similar might actually be occurring in a chronic neuropathic pain state. And so cr a chronic pain is of course a major problem in the human population and is a, an important area of study in neuroscience. And one of the features of chronic pain is that there's a phenomenon known as, as allodynia in which stimuli that are normally innocuous to a person will be experienced by a person in chronic pain as very painful. And so we thought perhaps there might be a similar recoding in a chronic pain state of normally innocuous stimuli or neutral stimuli to be represented by pain responsive neurons. And that was something that we investigated a subsequent, in a subsequent study. This was work led by Greg Porter, who now has a group at University of Pennsylvania, Biafra Hanano, and my former Stanford colleague, Greg Scher, who's now at the University of North Carolina. And we were very interested in whether neurons in the amygdala that might normally respond to innocuous stimuli might change their coding properties in a chronic pain state. And so again, we used the miniature microscope and the microendoscope to track neural activity in the amygdala and to examine cells responses to different categories of stimuli. So indeed, we were able to find neurons in the basal lateral amygdala, the BLA, that responded to different types of noxious stimuli. So here you can see some example traces of the cells that might respond to noxious heat, noxious cold, noxious pinprick, and a little bit less to light touch. And what was interesting about this category of cells in the BLA was that they seem to encode for um, many different kinds of noxious stimuli, but not other aversive stimuli. So these cells might um, might respond to noxious heat, noxious cold, noxious pinprick, but not to an aversive taste, for example, quinine. And we could separate those two stimuli based simply on the neural patterns of activity in the amygdala. So we called these, um, these pain responsive neurons a nociceptive uh, set of cells in the amygdala. And their activity levels was directly uh, predictive of the level of an animal's um, behavioral response um, to, for example, a pinprick. Now, we then looked at animals that um, were a model of chronic neuropathic pain in the human. And in these animals, we indeed found an analog of allodynia um, and its clinical symptoms after uh, a nerve injury in one of the limbs of the animal. We found that they responded uh, uh, to uh, a light, what would normally be a light touch as if it was painful. And when we looked in the amygdala, we found that the representation of an innocuous stimulus um, had really changed in a neuropathic pain state such now that neurons that were responding to uh, the light touch were in fact from this nociceptive ensemble. So this is as if the light touch has been recoded in the brain as something painful. Now using chemical genetic methods that I don't have time to describe, we were actually able to cure the mice of chronic pain symptoms by inhibiting the activity of just these nociceptive neurons in the amygdala. So this is a relatively tiny population of cells in the amygdala and of course in the brain at large, and yet inhibiting them had a profound impact on mouse behavior. And I think one of the most striking demonstrations of this is, is from what we call the cool plate assay. This is a plate in which one side is at room temperature and the other side is a little bit cool, 15 degrees centigrade. And it's well known that human patients with 
chronic pain will often experience a, a cool temperature as painful. And so you're looking here at a bird's eye view of the mouse's tracks along this plate, and they will stay, when they're in neuropathic pain, they will stay on the room temperature side and very much avoid the cool side of the plate. But by inhibiting just these nociceptive neurons in the amygdala, now the animal will freely explore both sides of the plate. And so you can see a profound change in animal and the mouse's activity just by inhibiting these pain coding neurons. So um, inhibiting this abnormal coding. So to summarize this part of the talk, I told you about two different conditions, Parkinsonian disease and dyskinesia, in which two different classes of spiny projection neurons, the different pathways, the direct and indirect pathway of the basal ganglia exhibited opposite imbalances of activity. And I didn't show you the data for this, but we found that uh, treatment for Parkinson's disease rebalances those, um, those activity patterns closer to their normal form. The other type of brain signature of disease that I just discussed is in which neurons will code abnormally for different stimuli. And the striking example here that was inspired by our fear conditioning studies is in chronic neuropathic pain, where a light touch can be abnormally recoded as painful. And so here, a treatment might, rather than rebalancing activities in the top case, it might target a very specific cell class and try to diminish its activity or recode it uh, to more resemble normal form. And I'd like to uh, close out the talk by uh, thanking again the collaborators who contributed to this work. I thank many of them as we went along, as well as the funding bodies that made this possible. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark, for a beautiful talk. That was really well done. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of questions. Go ahead and type into the chat or the question and answer, and I will read them out. Um, there was a comment that, uh, that Mark uh, from Catherine Corby that you were an excellent speaker, really appreciate the obvious preparation that he's made uh, for, to make this complex topic understandable to a lay person. So thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, Mark, I, I think you, you muted yourself, but um, yeah, oh. I, I, I had one question. So I was wondering about the time dependence. Um, when the calcium two, two plus uh, enters the neuron and, and how much of a time delay is there before the fluorescence effect to, to kick in? Yeah, great question. Um, so the onset is typically on sort of the 10 or tens of millisecond scale. Wow. Um, yeah. It depends a little bit on the particular neural structure that you're looking at, the particular cell type, particular calcium indicative use, but it's on that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. And um, the decline of the fluorescence signal is a little bit slower on the range of say 50 to 150 milliseconds or even longer if you have a very sensitive tight binding indicator. Okay. So this is, so you've, 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 you've touched upon in your question, one of the main limitations of calcium Im and imaging. So it gives us quite a lot of photons to work with mm -hmm. and it's rather, um, it's rather convenient in that regard, but be due to some of these uh, time delays, and there actually are often some nonlinearities in how this, the indicator responds to single spikes versus pairs or triplets of spikes. Uh, we're getting a, uh, a somewhat incomplete low pass filtered version of neural activity. Sure. Um, and so that was sort of the motivation for the field developing the optical voltage indicators, which would have much better time resolution at the millisecond or sub millisecond scale, which allow us to follow each and every action potential. But these indicators have other disadvantages or challenges uh, we need to use them with microscopes that are very fast. So a microscope that is capable of acquiring images at 1000 frames per second. Mm -hmm. um, and these indicators also tend to decline in their capabilities much fatter, faster due to a process that is known as fluorescence photo bleaching. Yeah. So uh, the field is gonna be using them both, I think for the foreseeable future. Okay, very cool. Um, so a couple of questions have come in from Noel James. Since the microendoscope results in basically a lobotomy, how much recovery is needed and do you see changes in normal behavior? Yeah, so um, I think the, 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 the person is asking basically what, what damage does the endoscope insertion do to, um, do to the mouse? So this is, I should say, is, this is not, not, a, not a lobotomy. So <laughs> a lobotomy refers to a specific procedure that is no longer done in humans um, that typically referred to a deliberate destruction of part of the frontal lobe. Um, in this case, we can be you know, tra traversing the endoscope through all sorts of, of different brain areas. And generally speaking, um, uh, one does not observe any uh, changes in the mouse's uh, behavior. 
Um, and in fact, all the signals that we get in these studies tend to look uh, exceedingly normal and consistent with what's been reported before in electrophysiological studies. And, and it's been very hard to detect um, any change in animal behavior, unless, for example, you might uh, deliver uh, two or more endoscopes, um, for example, in a bilateral manner, like deliberately targeting the same structure in a way that would be um, more akin to, you know, like a deliberate, um, a, de a deliberate lesion. So, so the technique has been very good in that regard. I think this uh, is largely due to the, um, the plasticity of the brain itself. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that um, these probes are actually much smaller than what's used in the human brain. So for example, a neuroendoscope would typically have uh, a diameter of about four millimeters. Um, and uh, the probes that are used in the neurostimulator in um, in that treatment for Parkinson's disease are also considerably broader. And yet the brain has a great plasticity and ability to adapt to and adjust its operations um, in response to these implants. So, so thankfully, uh, the neuronal responses and also the animal behavior post-implantation of these probes looks uh, typically very normal. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, there's a question by uh, Mark Reimers. He asks, the voltage traces showed spikes occurring at different levels of membrane potential rather than at a single threshold. Can you say more about the relation between spikes and membrane potential? Uh -huh. so, so typically, these spikes do occur at a, a fairly well-defined uh, so threshold. Um, it's, not, it's not an absolute. So, um, so there typically is a little bit of range, even in electrophysiological um, recording. Um, so this is a, it's an approximation, but it's a very good approximation that comes out of essentially the so-called Hodgkin-Huxley uh, equations. And I think um, there's also the, the issue, I'm not sure exactly what, which, which one of the traces that Mark was looking at, but there is an, there's an issue and there's a subtlety that the membrane over which we are collecting photons might not be exactly the same set of membrane area over which the cell is initiating its spike. So, so for example, the cell will typically initiate a spike at the cell body or the axonal hillock. And these are regions of the spike that are very dense in sodium channels, which give rise to the depolarizing phase of an action potential. But in some cases, we may be expressing the optical voltage indicator across the dendritic tree in areas that are less integral, but may nevertheless show various aspects of the spike depolarization. So there may be slight, um, slight lack of concordance there just due to some of these, uh, due to some of these subtleties. Okay, thank you, Mark. I, 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 I have another question. So I was actually quite blown away by that moving bar uh, visual representation in, in the brain that you could see the neuron. Yes. So how, can you talk more about this visual representation in the brain of what we see? Um, I don't know so much about that, if you could talk about that. Well, I mean, so, so that in a way is sort of the object of study in, um, in visual neuroscience. So trying to understand how the outside world, the visual world is transduced and processed in different parts of the visual system and ultimately leads, for example, to perception or object recognition. It allows the animal to navigate its sensory environment. Um, so, um, I mean, that's very much an, an ongoing uh, topic in the field. And I think you could see that, you know, due to the relatively sparse activity patterns in the visual cortex, that at least in the particular neuron class that I was showing you, the so-called layer two, three cortical pyramidal cells, there was not an immediately obvious representation mm -hmm. of the visual scene, but in the, in the colliculus, the spray colliculus, we could, you know, see something that looked like a more faithful representation. Um, so neuroscientists have over the years, um, studied in depth the different response properties of, of neurons in different portions of the visual system and have characterized the different visual cortical areas as an approximate hierarchy. That is an approximation because there's also feedback from higher order visual areas to the, um, uh, to the areas that are uh, more at the initial uh, stages of the so-called hierarchy. And now the field is very much interested in looking at um, how the local circuitry and inter-area circuitry may influence visual processing um, looking at how different cell types may influence the representations. And so that is very much, uh, Dean, an active area of investigation across the field. I can imagine. 
So uh, related to that, there's a question from Daniel Bazan. Uh, will you be able to trace not just neuronal activity, but also dendritic pathways activity as some movies you presented showed? Yes. So, so in many cases, we can see dendritic activity. Now that um, there's some challenges involved. So um, due to this issue uh, that I mentioned in response to the question from Mark Reimers, um, the, there are issues with where the optical ind indicator has been trafficked or targeted within the cell. And so recently there have been improved methods for targeting these optical indicators just to the cell body to um, alleviate this issue of maybe looking at some of the dendrites. But in other experiments, you might want to look just at the dendrites as, as Daniel's question um, suggests. So there are some ways of doing that. They're a little bit imperfect. You also have to have optical microscopes that would have, say, the resolution to pick out individual um, dendrites. And moreover, another important challenge is the fact that dendritic depolarization events tend to be more in sort of the 10 millivolt, maybe a little bit larger range, and would not be as, as large an amplitude, say, as the, you know, the approximately 100 millivolt depolarizations we would see in the spikes. So the signals are going to be smaller. Um, now, it can be done. And so an example of this is a recent paper from Rafael Eustace lab in Columbia uh, University in which they actually were able to look at uh, voltage activity directly in dendrites and in fact in dendritic spines, the postsynaptic morphological structures characteristic of these excitatory synapses that I mentioned in my, in my talk. So this is um, a, a recent development, but the short answer is yes, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. There are, I think, no more questions. So. Perhaps we can close the formal part of the talk right here.